I'm so sorry I missed yesterday because it seems like my talk is going to work really well with some of what came up there. So apologise, apologies in advance if there's a bit of repetition, but hopefully we can bring some of that in the discussion. Um, just to say a bit about who I am, I'm a senior lecturer at the Open University um, and also now a therapist. I'm working out of London Friend, just, just starting. Um, I've worked in the NHS before and at, up at the LGF in Manchester. Um, and I've been researching sex, gender and relationships for over a decade now um, and teaching on these matters. But perhaps one of the main things that I've done is I work with the organisation Bi UK that produced the Bisexuality Report. So for a long time I've been working around sexualities that fall outside the binary of gay and straight. Um, and I've also been teaching gender for all that time, but it's only recently that I've kind of turned my attention to genders that fall outside the binary um, explicitly, rather than just looking at gender and, and questioning the binary, but not. I think it's, it, it's because, you know, it's only in recent years there's been a lot of recognition of non-binary genders, and so that's something I'm going to touch on today. Um, and also that's like, um, as you probably can tell from Dominic's introduction, that's where my identity is. So, um, so it's personally relevant as well. So, um, so this talk, I'm going to do a quick overview, really, of the history and current thinking around non-binary genders. Um, and I know there's de definitely folk here who know more about some bits and pieces of it than I do. So, hopefully, we'll have plenty of chance for discussion as well. Um, and um, I think Michelle's talk is going to follow on really nicely from mine because it's going to focus much more on the therapeutic um, implications. But I'm going to end with kind of a, a, set, a set of kind of implications for therapists and practitioners that hopefully will be helpful. Um, perhaps the most important take home message from the talk is going to be um, that there's a massive diversity of experience within this category. And I think these um, pictures here on the slide illustrate that really nicely. This is from a recent San Francisco project um, where people um, have had their photos taken and underneath the photos they've got their own identities. Again, the website's on, on my presi at the end so you can have a look at them yourself. But these are all pictures of people who identify in some way as queer or non-binary. Um, and you can see there's a, a massive range of sort of identities and experiences in that group. And obviously, importantly, how a gender, for, just as with anyone who's binary gender, also people with non-binary gender, their gender intersects with many other aspects of their identity and experience, such as race, class, age, sexuality, body type, disability, etc. And again, you can see that a little bit in the, in the depictions here. So we're talking about a real diverse range of experiences. Uh, so to start with a bit of history, um, so in the, in the West currently, as we know, gender is seen as dichotomous, you're either one thing or you're another, binary or dichotomous um, are the words that are used. So um, to, that's to the extent that often men and women are seen as being from different planets, and we use that phrase opposite sex or opposite gender, right? Um, I'm currently analysing sex advice books, um, which is a an exciting research project that I've just got started on, and it's unbelievable, you know, how much this gender binary is present in these sex advice books. You know, men and women are assumed to be entirely different kinds of people, wanting entirely different kinds of sex, and entirely different um, when it comes to relationships. Um, so that sort of men are from Mars, women are from Venus idea really pervades, mm -hmm. and we can see that in the way that so many products are gendered. So, for example, men's and women's magazines, uh, toys, clothes, bags, you know even things that really don't need to be gendered also. So, so you know, that's our backdrop. So, you know, the whole idea of non-binary <coughs> seems very strange to people because that's, you know, so much how, how they see the world because you know, that's what they've grown up with. But it is quite new historically. So even in, um, in the UK, if you look at earlier historical periods, often it was seen that there was, was one gender and that women were an inferior version of that gender. So men were kind of the norm, women were an inferior version of men. So we used to have a one gender model, uh, now there's a two gender model. But in many other cultures, um, there's either a continuum model of gender or multiple gender terms, and there's just a few that I've included on the, the set there. So, so if we look culturally, we see that the two gender model is only just one model out of many that are possible. Um, why do we have it? Well, it's rooted in what they call heteronormativity, you know, a word I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Um, but it's the idea that both gender and sexuality are binary, and generally it's been the, the sense that one is better than the other, man better than woman, heterosexuality better than homosexuality. Um, 
and and that when it, that the other ones have been needed to shore up the kind of primary ones in a way. So heterosexual masculinity has often been kind of defined as in opposition to gay masculinity and to femininity. And there's some really interesting qualitative research where <coughs> heterosexual guys are, are, are chatting and you hear them kind of positioning themselves in relation to those two things with jokes, etc., to kind of shore up their, their heterosexual masculinity. And um, femininity has often been defined very much as what isn't, what isn't masculine. So that system is kind of the basis. And of course, consumerism is kind of now implicated in all of this because it kind of it has a vested interest in maintaining it because you can sell twice as many products if you have products that are gendered. Um, and also, I think that the the fear that a lot of people have of being too feminine or too masculine is a good fear for for sort of people who are trying to sell their products to to, to work on because it makes people want to buy things that will make sure up <coughs> their sense of gender. So there is a lot of fear. Um, and kind of anxiety around gender and people who are within the, the binary system of it. Um, and if you think about gay rights and, and feminism, they've both challenged these binary systems in a way because they've challenged the idea that one shouldn't be as, as good as seen as good as the other, but often they haven't gone so far as to challenging the binary system itself. So if you think about gay rights, it's been about getting gay on a par with, with straight but generally hasn't been much about questioning the gay straight, straight dichotomy. In fact, it's even been more within that. So that's where we get the kind of double discrimination against bisexual people that's happened and the invisibility of bisexuality because in a way people on, on both the straight and the gay side have had a kind of vested interest in maintaining a binary. Um, and similar thing is true for, for feminism. It's been about getting women on a par with men, but only some feminisms have been really interested in questioning the binary itself it's been, you know, most of them have kind of bought into a, a binary system of gender. Um, so a key person here is the psychologist Sandra Benn, who I've only just started reading up on for a chapter I'm writing. She's really interesting. So back in the 1970s, um, she did this research that suggested that androgyny was more healthy than being either sort of far-end masculine or far-end feminine. So she had this famous BEM sex role inventory that she gave out to people, and she found that those who had a kind of, um, they weren't high on masculinity or femininity, seemed to do better in a number of ways, sort of in terms of psychological well-being, than those who were high in masculine, men who were high in masculinity or women who were high in femininity. Um, and on the basis of this, she argued very strongly to eradicate gender. You know, she wanted to get rid of the gender categories of men and women and just have people seen as people. Um, and one of the things she was saying was maybe we should see somebody's gender or sex as important, only as important as their eye colour. So she pointed out that eye colour could be hetero, hetero or homo, and that we could fancy people with the same eye colour or a different eye colour, but we don't make much of a thing about it. And maybe, you know, we, we do think gender's that important, but it doesn't need to be. But really interestingly, Sandra Baum had a, a shift in the 1990s in her thinking. So she decided at that point that there was just no way of getting rid of the, the gender binary, as in let's not have categories of man and woman, let's just see people as people. And instead she, she, she made this quote here. She said, I propose that we let a thousand categories of sex gender desire begin to bloom in any and all fluid and permeable configurations. And through that very proliferation, that we therefore undo the privileged status of the two and only two as are currently treated as normal and natural. Mm. Which was 20 years before <laughs> what finally happened on Facebook this year, which was exactly what she was hoping for. So basically she moved from an idea of get rid of the, gen the two genders to an idea of if we have a massive proliferation of gender terms, maybe that will do the same job. Um, and that's where we're, we are right at the moment, which is a really exciting time, I think, in that, you know, in back on Valentine's Day, I think it was, uh, this year, Facebook, um, at least in America, um, enabled people to choose from 58 different gender terms. Um, and you can do this in the UK by just choosing the American system. So basically, uh, if you choose, you get gender, male, female, or custom, and if you choose custom, you get 58 different terms to choose from. I think it's 56 in addition to the, the, the other two. Um, and that includes a number of cisgender and transgender gender terms, So, but it also includes a number of genders that fall either between or outside of the gender binary. 
Um, and furthermore, you've got the possibility of choosing a pronoun out of he, she, or they now, which is something I'll come back to. This is a lovely uh, picture of David Bowie and Tilda Swinton from his most recent music video, and it's uh, it's Bowie dressed as Swinton and Swinton dressed as Bowie. I think it's kind of amazing. Um, so you know, another another example of something quite recently that's been about sort of questioning gender binaries. Um, so just to sort of get, run through a few, because you know we're in this kind of new territory, and there's a, there is a proliferation of words, and it will be really interesting to see whether they continue to proliferate, you know, or and that's kind of why I chose the snowflake background here. You know, is, is it going to be that there's almost an idea that everyone has their own unique gender, as in the San Francisco pictures, you know, everyone's words to just sort of describe themselves is slightly different, um, you know, or is it going to kind of get more simple, is it going to be that a few terms become the ones that are most accepted um, and, and people start adhering to those, I'm not sure. But at the moment this is what we have. So we have a number of words for people who incorporate aspects of both man and woman, <coughs> mixed gender, sometimes the word pan gender or androgynous. There's a number of words for people having no gender, like gender neutral or agender or genderless. There's a number of words for people who move between genders, like bi-gender, gender fluid, sometimes pan-gender. Pan-gender gets used for pretty much all of these things. So. Um, and some for being a specific additional gender, um, so, so either something between men and women or something additional to those, ge those two genders, uh, so third gender or other gender. Um, there's a few that are about moving between multiple genders, like tri-gender, and again, sometimes pan-gender. And then there's some words specifically for those wanting to disrupt the gender binary or the gender dichotomy, like gender queer, gender fuck, and recently I heard gender warrior. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the last one is, is, you know, has the specifically political agenda attached to it, whereas some of the others don't specifically have that attached. And it's important to highlight that as with most identities, and certainly most sexual identities, some non-binary people experience it as something natural, um, something that they, they just are. Some people see it as something that's developed over time. Some people see it as a specific political choice or, or a choice they've made. Um, some people see it as fixed and static, maybe something they've been since birth. Other people see it as something fluid and changeable. And you know, we have to, again, respect a, the multiplicity of experiences and labels for the experiences, and B, the fact that some, you know, it isn't going to be that we're going to find out either it's natural or it's cho chosen. You know, it's going to be different for different people in terms of how they experience um, their non binary gender. Um, Dominic asked me to cover the prevalence of non binary gender, so I've been <laughs> scraping around trying to find every study that sort of tried to estimate. Um, and there's lots of words on this slide, but basically it comes down to we don't know. <laughs> but I'll go through how we don't know first. Um, so, well, the first important thing to say is that both biological, even if, you know, there's questions over even whether you can separate out biological sex from a person's gender role, but on every level of sex and or gender, we can say that it's not binary. So whether we're looking at chromosomes, hormones, primary and secondary sex characteristics, um, the neural structures and, and makeup or gender roles, all of those things are non-binary. So the gender-fed person by Sam Killerman um, from, from his recent book about gender is a, is a good example of how you know, he's seeing everything, gender, identity, biological, sex, sexual orientation, all on, all on a continuum. I mean, even that one doesn't quite work. My, when I was looking at gender in my book, Rewriting the Rules, I kind of went to the continuum model from the, the raw model, and then even that, you know, because it's the continuum from masculine to feminine, for example, it breaks down when you think, well, which do we mean by masculine? Are we talking about dominance to sort of passive? passivity and submission, or we're talking about being rational to being emotional, and I use cartoons in that book to kind of illustrate, depending on how we define masculinity and femininity, different people would move around these continuums, so even continuums are a little bit, a little bit problematic. But, but going back to the biological bits, you know, obviously when we're thinking about intersex, um, the, the estimates are about 0.5 to 2 percent of the population, um, and the biologist, the biologist and folks to Sterling very much says, you know, this is on the spectrum. Um, we think of, you know, biological sex as being high level, but it's, it's definitely on a spectrum. 
but not all intersex folk ide identify as non-binary, in fact probably most of them don't identify as non-binary, but some of them don't even know that they are in any way intersex or DSD, um, and also not all, not all non-binary folk are intersex by any means, so there is some overlap between those categories but also a lot of separation. Um, and I think it's just helpful to see gender as biopsychosocial, you know, that those things are woven together. We can't tease them apart. There's some things about how, you know, our bodies are when we're born that set us up in certain ways, but there's also things about how we're treated socially that then affect how our brains wire up. You know, it's, we can't pull it all apart. And, and why should we? You know, again, it gets back to, you know, do we need to know how much, you know, what the prevalence is in order to treat people equally? Not really. Do we need to know whether it's biological or psychological or sociological or what, what, what amount of those things to treat people decently? Not really. You know, we get so hung up on those kind of questions that we, we miss the important questions, really, I think. Um, so, talking to people like my colleagues Alexi and Taffy and Christina Richards, who were here, uh, who was here yesterday, um, they reckon about 10 to 15 percent of the people they see in trans services um, are non-binary. Um, so that might be a, a useful estimate for people who want to figure on it. Um, but of course, not all non-binary folks see themselves as trans, so they may not all engage in trans services, so that's a, a tricky one. And some non-binary people really challenge even the, the cis-trans binary, because um, if we think of trans meaning, you know, or cis meaning remaining in the gender assigned at birth, some people, well, they feel they have remained in the gender they were assigned at birth, but they like to have a different appearance. So. You know, are they are non-binary people under cis or under trans? You know, it's not always clear. A, a lot of people like the trans asterisks and do feel that non-binary is part of that wider umbrella term. Um, the recent Metro Youth Chances study, I've included the graph from it, because they found that um, with LGBT young people they were studying, LGBTQ young people they were studying, um, that 5% identified as something other than female or male. And a similar US study on LGBTQ young folk said that 10% of the people they studied were what they called gender expansive. Which I really like. Gender expansive. Gender warrior, gender expansive. New words. You heard it here. <laughs> um, Scottish Trans Alliance, um, just a recent survey on trans mental health, found that over a quarter of the trans people um, that they studied identified as non binary or agendered. But it's so difficult to know how many people would identify in these ways if these things were more available. Just as an anecdote, when I was visiting Alexi and Taffy last year in um, Minneapolis, um, we had um, uh, somebody there who was working with trans people in, in uh, schools in um, Minnesota. And he was saying that, you know, because he was going into those schools and talking all about trans, there was one kid in every year group who was saying, I think that might be me, with some variety of trans asterisks. Whereas there was somebody coming in from sort of rural areas around that, sort of about 100 miles away, I think, from that town, who was saying in schools they were working in, people still didn't get gay. So, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's going to be so different in different contexts, and also that who knows what it would be like if it really... If we lived in a world where all of this was, you know, perfectly, seems perfectly fine, then it might be a lot of people. Really interesting final study on this slide by Joel et al. Um, found that they studied what they call sort of a normative population, I guess that's what I mean, non-trans people, <coughs> non-LGBT people, and found that, that when, they, when they surveyed them, about 35% of people within a normative population felt to some extent as either the other gender, or as both a man and a woman, or as neither, which is a massive statistic. So, yeah, so the answer is we don't know. <laughs> quite a lot. A long way, I'd say. Quite, it is quite a lot. Quite yeah. a lot. It's probably quite a lot. <laughs> okay, so this is the first question people tend to ask about non-binary gender when the issue is raised. Um, and it, it's about, you know, uh, people's preference of pronoun. I think there's a, there's a, well, whenever I've mentioned it online, it tends to get into this discussion of people saying we don't want made up words, you know, for people's pronouns and whether it's grammatically correct or not to use the word they as an individual pronoun. Um, and I think some of this is about people can't really say I'm uncomfortable about non-binary gender, but what they can have a big discussion about is whether it's grammatically <laughs> correct to use the word they or, or whether it's okay to make up words. And I think it's a bit of a way of expressing one's discomfort um, without having to say, you know, I'm discomforted by this person. Um, 
So, so don't do that, <laughs> if possible. Um, Non-gendered pronouns you might come across include Z, C, Per. Um, the word Per comes from the sci-fi book uh, Women on the Edge of Time by Marge Percy, which is a really interesting book if you want to say, she imagines a non-gendered future where everybody is just a person, hence Per. Um, but the existing word they is perfectly acceptable, and I'm just going to show you this little YouTube clip, which uh, is a linguist called Tom Scott, who uh, tells us why they can be used. Um, I mean, the only thing I dispute on that is the kind of, he does go into the, we don't like made up words, and actually some people do have reasons for, for preferring one of the more singular words rather than plural they. Um, particularly some people don't like the plurality of it, but other people specifically do like the plurality of it and they're not going into the different theories of self, but if you subscribe to the idea that maybe we're multiple or plural rather than singular selves, then they works pretty well for everybody. Um, so again, you know, the best thing is uh, ask Etika. You know, if you're not sure, ask somebody. Um, and if, it, if people get pronouns wrong, which we're going to do a lot, especially as people have more different pronouns they want to use, then I think the answer is just apologise and move on. You know, not making a big deal out of it is the way. Um, pronouns introductions is really good practice, or having <coughs> pronouns on badges, that kind of thing, I think. You know, and, and not assuming that because somebody does look fairly binary gender, that that means that they're necessarily going to use the pronouns that go with that. So, a few other aspects of language to think about. Some people prefer um, a non-gendered title, so that's worth thinking about. And at the moment, there isn't much apart from MX rather than MR for Mr. or MS for Ms. Um, I feel very lucky that I'm a doctor, so I don't have to <laughs> worry about this problem, but we can't all go around getting doctorates just so that we won't have a, a binary <laughs> gender title. Um, and the sort of references to people by gender are also worth thinking about. Um, so, you know, maybe thinking about trying to refer to people as person unless their gender is actually important. And definitely thinking about the use of sir, madam. You know, in contexts where people refer to everyone by sir or madam, like some restaurants and shops, you're just constantly gendered by people. So, you know, if there's a way of avoiding that um, by using something else, like love or mate or something. Um, you know, it's interesting how different parts of the country have terms of endearment that are or aren't gendered. And, and uh, that, that's a, uh, also, you know, referring to friends and colleagues in a speech rather than ladies and gentlemen, you know, is another good practice, I think. Um, in terms of the possibilities for language for individuals, some people change their name, some people don't change their name, some people adopt a gender neutral name, some people use initials like the musician C.N. Lester, um, whose blog I've taken quite a few ideas from. Some people have a middle name in brackets, so the queer theorist Judith Jack Halberstam um, does that. Uh, some people use different names on different occasions. Um, people think about relationship words as well, like partner as an alternative to girl or boyfriend, sibling as an alternative to brother or sister, offspring is one that my folks have been trying on for size, <laughs> other than daughter. Um, <laughs> um, and some people I mean, the thing is that you are going to get gendered so much in society, so for some of us, I think, just being gendered sometimes as male and sometimes as a woman, some, sometimes as one, sometimes another, is kind of better than, than constantly being gendered as one or the other, given that we can't be non-gendered in terms of just general kind of walking around the world. Um, so part of my enjoyment of this cap means that I, I sometimes get gov or sir, um, or sometimes sir, and then a really long gap, and then madam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sort of feels, feels a bit better than, than, than just getting one or the other. Um, and obviously non-verbal, you know, images like this just omnipresent, which suggest a binary gender system, so worth thinking about too. Um, in terms of appearance, possibilities uh, for a non-binary appearance include adopting the appearance of a gender other than the one assigned at birth, cultivating a specifically androgynous appearance, adopting aspects of masculinity and femininity simultaneously, um, or adopting them differently according to context, or changing the mode of time. 
Um, one of the key issues at the moment is that body image ideals for non-binary people are not very diverse. So a search for androgyny gave me this bunch of people who aren't all thin, white, no visible disability, and very, very fashion conscious individuals. So we really need to work on the diversity of images of non-binary gender so people aren't stuck with a really limiting kind of body image ideal. Um, or, or an, only one kind of body image that will actually be read as non-binary. Um, there are potential surgeries and hormonal interventions that people might want to, you know, similar to, to with trans. And it is becoming possible on the NHS. I don't know if Christina mentioned this at all yesterday, but certainly the services I know that she works in um, are fairly positive about this possibility now. Um, and also privately, obviously, it's possible. Um, I don't know if people have seen Janet Mock's excellent video about the, the whole thing of asking people about their genitalia or asking about surgeries, but yes, it's just as rude <laughs> for non-binary as it is for trans, so not asking who somebody really is or using male assigned at birth or female assigned at birth as terms for people's identity unless they use them themselves. Um, well, and yeah, I've got two minutes to finish, which is pretty good timing I think. Uh, so yeah, here's a few implications that I've drawn so far but you know it's very much a work in progress. Um, thinking about demographic forms, you know you might want to avoid gender demographics unless they're actually relevant and if you do have them make sure you provide further options, you know either the whole range as in Facebook or uh, perhaps just some kind of uh, empty category for people to put in their preferred term would be better than having you know, multiple terms. Um, thinking about the visibility of non-binary people, so if you've got a service that has kind of posters up and pamphlets and things, then it's really important to make sure di diverse non-binary people are um, represented there. Um, you know, in, it's probably fairly obvious for avoiding any segregation around gender, so not having workshops where you divide into boys versus girls and that kind of thing. Um, considering non-gendering of toilets, especially when it's not really necessary to, to have them gendered. Um, Maybe, you know, if you want to get a bit more activist, pressing for non-gendered option on passports like they have in Australia and India, or further recognition of genders. So I think in, people might have seen in the news this week, um, the person in Sydney called Norrie, who was legally recognised as a non-specific sex. Um, that kind of legal recognition can be really important in terms of visibility. Um, so if you want to sort of, rather than just working with the individuals who live in a gendered society, actually start trying to change society, then there's quite a number of activist things you might do. Um, being supportive of parents who are not gendering their children, you know, there are increasing numbers of parents who are, you know, letting kids figure it out for themselves rather than gendering them. Um, and maybe activism around gendered toys, so this is a wonderful art project um, of kids with their toys. Um, which just goes to show quite how badly gendered it can be. Um, so, an important thing to remember is that wider culture is still very binary. So, when talking with somebody who's non binary gender, they will be wanting to talk properly about, you know, if that's a relevant issue. I mean, a lot of the time, it just won't, simply won't be relevant to their presenting problem. But if they do want to talk about being non binary, then some of the, some of the implications are to make sure you talk about what that's like for them within a, within a kind of binary world. And also, not expecting people to be post-children. You know, there's always a thing with a, a kind of new identity, is that people who are a kind of expected to be perfect examples all the time fit in a particular way. And queer academia is really at fault for this, so we're expecting people to be kind of perfect post-children for queer theory. You know, that's another thing not to expect. Um, on, on the bus today, I came up with an idea as well, that to be aware that people are doubly, doubly discriminated against, potentially. So something in relation to bisexuality is double discrimination, that a lot of bisexual people face discrimination from heterosexual communities and from um, lesbian and gay communities. But I think for non-binary people, they're often double, double discrimination, because there's the, you don't, there's sort of heterosexual versus lesbian and gay communities then, and some non-binary people do face discrimination from lesbian and gay communities, like you've let the side down from lesbians, or some gay men thinking of them as a kind of experiment um, sexually. Um, that came up when I was interviewing sort of non-binary people for a project. But also there's a double discrimination sometimes from cis and trans communities, so there can be a sense of, well, you're not really cis, but you're not really trans. And again, the non-binary people I spoke to had very different experiences of this. A lot of people felt very accepted within lesbian and gay and within trans spaces. But the danger is a double, double discrimination that not fitting in heterosexual or lesbian and gay and not fitting in cis or trans. 
Um, so I think to end, just saying that you know, the more you can sort of get across the idea of a diversity of possible experiences rather than just one way of being non-binary, the better. Thank you very much.